Hello, gamers. Well, we are only days away now from the big showdown at E3 again this year. That will be the first true year of pretty much all games being shown being now gen and PC bound only. This means that we will start to see engines that were designed or updated to be fully targeted at the memory, processors and GPUs of these consoles and PC as a base. And what this means is visual and audio heaven galore with hopefully a similar push in game design. One of these multi-platform games is Star Wars Battlefront that has already piqued the interest of many, along with the doubters everywhere. This pessimistic gamer seems to be very prevalent at present, with some level of understandability therein. Asking, what will it look like? This is only fake, high-end PC, you know the song. We now have an in-engine game trailer to show off just what DICE have been busy doing with the Frostbite engine since Battlefield 4, and the results, I think, speak for themselves. But it, is it all just smoke and mirrors, with this not being indicative at all of the actual game? Well, I am to dissect the trailer and highlight where and how, along with my thoughts on this. But to do this first, I need to clarify what we are seeing here, and just what the whole in-engine, real-time, pre-rendered, in-game, pie-in-the-sky, and so forth that all these prompts mean. As we are now closer to seeing games started when the gen kits were out in the hands of devs coming to completion, I feel that certain things need to, and hopefully have, begun changing. Long time viewers know I'm not a fan of pre-rendered CGI trailers. Deus Ex gets a pass here. Last year's E3, certainly from Microsoft, had far too many of these. Crackdown, Halo 5, Scalebound, and now cancelled Phantom Dust being a poignant example of just how little these trailers mean. As to gauge even the look of a game, let alone the style, play mechanics, or even game design, is nigh impossible from the pitch mock-ups that are most likely created by an offline CG house who have a brief and make a high-quality trailer to suit the spec. This is mostly a waste, a high-quality, non-representative display of a game that is most likely nothing like the trailer shown and may not even exist yet, as was the case of many of the list above. This form of trailer is your pre-rendered, your offline, non-game machine or even game engine created trailer. Think of them as a poster to a movie, nothing more representative than that. Next, we move into the actual game engine trailers. These are running on the developer's machine, so maybe ultra high spec PC, but runs under the same conditions, code and assets as the actual game engine can handle, with the limit being the maximum the game engine can handle running on very high powered machines. Note here, do not confuse these with consumer level hardware. And this is what we have here with the new Star Wars trailer. It is an actual genuine showing of the improvements the engine has undertaken, and is the best case scenario of it in action. But, and this needs to be stressed, these are cutscenes, non-interactive scripted sequences with director set cameras, post effects and action entirely designed like a movie with everything preset and determined. Now this is not fake or a scam, nothing more than putting on your Sunday best. It shows off all the elements of your engine to the fullest with models, scenery, post processing, all on the highest level. A game will not and cannot look like this. The first thing is the camera is set from the player's view, so will alter entirely how a scene or sequence plays out. What you see here is how the real-time in-engine cinematics or cutscenes will play out just like the ones here in the Order 1886. Now this is all running on the actual game engine and being generated in real time by the machine that is simply running through the pre-calculated events as designed by the scripter but as you can see the difference between the two is very minor and in some cases non-existent Company man down. but is this all genuine real footage completely untouched as we expect well, no, not entirely, as there are some obvious signs of alterations you will always need to take into account. This is not a native 1080 image, most likely downsampled from a 4K or maybe even higher native render, but this is also running at 30fps, well the video released is anyway, where the game will run at 60, with the cinematics hopefully also running at the same rate, but it could also be a signal that they may not. But the trailer gives us many more signs that it is indeed showing a game engine off. I warn you that many things I will show here you cannot unsee, if you have not noticed them before, so be warned. You can see the lack of any shadows from lasers or explosions in many shots, along with it missing illuminating parts of the scenery, or being random. Reflections of lasers on water is absent, as is any reflection of dynamic objects like the TIE Fighters in this shot. 
Explosions have a simple specular texture reflection that is pinned to the centre of the explosion, rather than a distorted one you would expect. Water is very static and lacking, at least in this trailer, any heavy tessellation or dynamic surface reactions that Battlefield 4 had, showing that it is making compromises in use elsewhere. The complete lack of any screen space tricks in the trailer show how forked off the engine is from the one powering Hardline, which uses these tricks as you can see. But great texture work and tessellation is used in the scene. Best noticed here, prior to Vader's appearance, you can see the LOD switches and adaptive tessellation happening on geometry behind the Rebels as they move. This is the engine gearing up or essentially cutting back on heavy bandwidth or computational load when not needed or noticed. In this case, the geometry is for the heavily detailed Vader model and DOF with Bokka that is of a very high quality. We can see obvious signals and giveaways to a real engine working under the kind of constraints that real time needs. Most of the background scenery and smoke is static in this shot. Pretty much most of these signs all being something that a pre-render would not need to worry about, even in an engine one like this. But the biggest issue many have with believing this is the IQ on offer, which is superb and much better than the previous game under this engine, helped a lot by the down sample in this trailer back into the 1920x1080 display. But there are easy answers to this and also as to why. Let me explain. All previous games on this engine have still ran with the constraints of last generation, shared assets. There is only so much any team can do when something has to scale across such vast hardware specs that entail a less than 500 megabyte console with much weaker GPU and even CPU along with code and changes and instruction sets that I mentioned more in my console article. Once you have to simply aim at x86 CPUs and the relevant set of simmed and other benefits of design just as a start, then so much more is possible as your base is much, much higher along with the benefits they all offer up. Again, GPU instructions, let alone power, is vastly improved for developers now with these constraints removed and then the vast potential of options with game engine can really begin as the programmers get clever with what is on offer. And this applies just as much to RAM, which helps both texture quality and anti-aliasing options in conjunction with vast hardware improvements. And here we are seeing what 2K or greater photorealistic texture quality brings to the immersion in the game. Improved greater still by the physically based shader work and high quality normal maps aligned with the shown tessellation and I'm sure possibly parallax occlusion mapping and other texture work in the game. All these combine with much greater mesh quality on objects and characters that raise the visual bar much higher than we are used to outside of some glimpses already in games like Drive Club, The Order or AC Unity and many more we will see this year at E3. Not only this, but the scope of what is now possible with the lighting allows a more realistic use of this in dynamic light sources like here with a small flash from large explosions, but also in global illumination. This is how light is absorbed, diffused or reflected by objects thus bounces around a scene and cross illuminates other areas, even bring the colour of the reflective source as seen in Drive Club and Alien Isolation. And this, as I have said before, is one of the biggest area of visuals will change this gen, all tied in with PBR shader work. Like many areas, not only vastly improves the visual quality, but also reduces artist workloads and thus development schedules and budgets, or just most likely, it will be used elsewhere. Now the other area that we'll be experimented with is anti-aliasing as I said, with both consoles running GCN derived GPUs that both support many more features at a hardware level including MSAA. As we have seen from Michael Drobolt and Ubisoft in Far Cry 4 and the superb and experimental HRAA solution, Hybrid Reconstruction, that uses much lower level GPU access to reuse calculated data again to improve the temporal image quality from the colour buffer. Again, Advanced Warfare saw a new slant on SMAA being demoed, at least on PC. Again, the order used not only 4 times MSA, but also additional work within the text composites to deliver the cleanest image this generation outside of super sampling. Now that DX12 has hit PC along with Vulkan, taken over from Mantle now as the two lower level but more specifically less constrained by legacy practices. This will allow developers, of which DICE are at the forefront of this in both the console and PC space as far as multi-platform goes, to better and more efficient methods and we are already seeing this happen. This on its own is more important than just the simple resolution number itself, although this does still matter. As we move into this generation, not only will these newer techniques make pixel counting harder, 
but they will also offer up a leap on image quality over what we are used to. Here I believe we are seeing this with the latest trailer. With the Frostbite engine being a tile deferred renderer, this means that as a scene is drawn, the screen is broken down into smaller sections and grids. These are then calculated for depth, culling, etc. so that hidden pixels are not sampled for texture lookups and waste in bandwidth, but also that it can be run and calculated in tandem across the GPU cores. All this allows it to not only scale well across hardware, the Xbox One's SRAM will be heavily used here for these tiles and offers up the use of MSAA along with MLAA and any other temporal work which as I say will be a big part of graphics programmers work at present. Expect this to be a moving feast for a while as different solutions and trials are made and attempted like the very clever temporal reprojection solution used in Guerrilla Games technical tour de force Killzone Shadowfall made even more impressive by being a launch title. This used two frames merged to create a full 1920 widescreen image from two 960 native renders for the multiplayer portion of the game. So good in fact, it took a while for this to be brought to life. And this along with other games we have seen glimpses of the push into much more impressive and photorealistic visuals. I jest not when I say that this sequence would not look out of place in Return of the Jedi as the team should be highly applauded in not only capturing the feel, aesthetic and lighting of the famous Endor battle but also surpassing the film's then groundbreaking visual effects in a real time cinematic from a game. I myself cannot wait to see how this game looks when shown in a few days and more so how well it scales across hardware. Expect a softer image than here with the game still being 60fps on all formats, I expect both machines to run around to or just below the full 1080 with some minor cutbacks and if you want the 60 target, that to also be a sacrifice on a great many PCs as well. But looking at the game's level of destruction and dynamic action, it does seem to have been reduced or pointed to some CPU design work to help out the console's set of CPUs, with PC using good old brute force due to its varied spec level. The game also showed signs of being more aimed towards the console specs and more specifically the CPU concession. From Battlefield 4, 64 man multiplayer has now had over a 35% cutback on player count, now down to 40 players, with the amount of dynamic destruction and interaction as mentioned earlier. All this makes sense but the huge improvement on visuals and target high frame rate that I'm sure is using asynchronous shader work on both consoles and AMD GPUs, I am pretty confident this will be vying for best graphics award next week at E3. With vehicles being usable in the game from land speeders, X-Wings and even the Millennium Falcon, I am sure that it will be hectic and exciting without any space battles. It will not have a single player per se, but more a more progression built through maps that can be played online or offline, including a split screen option. With many other modes of battle, it will have a lot to offer to the Star Wars fans or just battle fans alike. Whether you battle with friends or hand solo, it looks to be another exciting show from EA DICE and within a huge collection next week. I think DICE have used the last two years well in getting the Star Wars license and EA are all set to have a huge hit on their hands come Christmas to this release. And from the looks of this show and I fully expect them to put the memory of Battlefield 4 aside and set a new level for multi-platform games, even more so at the highly desired frame rates of 60. As always, I hope you guys and girls enjoyed this. If you did, then please hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps me immensely. Please leave your thoughts and feedback below. You guys and girls take care, and I'll see you very soon on the next one.